As all members have received a copy of the minutes of our October meeting, the reading of those minutes will be omitted. Are there any proposed changes to the draft October minutes? Hearing none, the minutes, what is that feedback? The minutes as submitted stand adopted upon unanimous consent. I wanna thank you, thank all those who are here in person for joining us tonight. My name is Tom Byrne, RTM moderator. We do have um, a few administrative matters to take care of. Bob McKnight, chair of our appointments committee has asked to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, I'm Bob McKnight, Chair of your Appointments Committee. I would like to advise all interested RTM members, the Appointments Committee is seeking new members for the Claims Committee, the Labor Contracts Committee, and a Housing Trust Fund Advisory Council. Your Appointments Committee will interview prospective candidates in February for placement on the March call. We have a deadline set for submitting CVs of those interested on Friday, January 28th at 12 p.m. noon. Briefly, the Claims Committee has unique power to speak for the entire RTM and approve appropriation of the BET for payment, compromise, and settlement of legal claims against the town upon recommendation of the town attorney. Our labor contracts informs and advises the body with respect to approving contracts for our town's employees and serving as a liaison to the town's negotiator to communicate the RTM's inclinations for concession or rejection. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund Advisory Council was recently established to, to preserve and create new affordable rental and ownership housing in town. Each committee and council requires unique skill sets and time requirements, which has been emailed to each of you for your examination of possible interest. Further information can be found on the RTM website. At this time, I'd also like to advise you that the Inland Wetlands and Water Courses Agency is seeking to fill three vacancies and the RTM Harbor Management Liaison position is open to all members interested. They can contact me or my secretary, Jude Collins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleen Jenkins of District 6. Tonight, we honor Arlene Lamazo, who has been in the representative town meeting for 38 years. <laughs> I interviewed Arlene for two hours in preparation for a proclamation. And during the interview, two aspects of Arlene service floated to the top and I'd like to share them with you. First, she took a tragic death of her 16 year old son on route one by Greenwich High School. She turned grief into action, armed with her irrefutable arguments about sidewalks and public safety. She persuaded the powers to examine and fund 19 sidewalk gaps in Route 1 between Byram and Old Greenwich. Today, she departs but she and her colleagues leave a legacy, an enduring gift to the town of Greenwich, a safer sidewalk situation. My second point that floats to the top is Arlene's deep respect for town governance based on civility, respect, and patience in listening to each other. 
She underscores the RTM is a nonpartisan body run by citizens of the town and dedicated to the affairs of the town. So today we honor Eileen Lamazo and thank you for leaving the town of Greenwich a better place. <laughs> On Saturday, I was <clears throat> babysitting a granddaughter who needed to go out for a walk and be put to sleep. And I ended up on Shore Road in Old Greenwich. And if you walk on Shore Road where there are no sidewalks, you will today see signs advocating for sidewalks on Shore, SOS, they have a website. And Arlene came directly to mind. So, Maybe Arlene can help out that effort in, in District 6. Thank you, Colleen. That was wonderful. Uh, Michael Spilo, Chair of our uh, Public Works Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. On behalf of the Public Works Committee, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Arlene for her many years of dedicated service to our town and to the Public Works Committee. Arlene is one of the longest serving members of the Public Works Committee and served as our chair for several terms. She developed several of the processes and procedures we continue to use within the committee. Arlene has always been thorough, very detail oriented and on top of progress with all town projects. And as you've heard, Arlene was a strong advocate for sidewalks and pedestrian safety. safety. And our children are safer walking to and from school, largely due to her efforts. Uh, we thank Arlene for her hard work and dedication and wish her all the best in her future endeavors. Thank you. And we have our Sluckman Lauren Raven. Hi, everyone. Arlen, don't go. Arlene, don't go. Um, I have a proclamation. Whereas Arlene Lamazo has dedicated 60 years of public service to our town, and whereas she taught at Coscob, Hamilton Avenue, and Western Middle School for 31 years, and whereas Arlene turned the tragic death of her 16-year-old son into a 21-year mission for, pub, for pedestrian safety on Putnam Avenue and other roadways in town, and whereas she advocated for her cause tirelessly with multiple town bodies to analyze, fund, and build sidewalks, and whereas Arlene was a force behind the creation of the Selectman's Public Safety Committee and subsequently elected to the representative town meeting for 38 years, and whereas she was labeled very persuasive, in quotes, in her pursuit of her mission, fact-finding site visits and navigation of the government bodies to make an enduring gift of pedestrian safety in town. Therefore, on behalf of Fred Camillo, first selectman of the town of Greenwich, I do proclaim Wednesday, December 15th, 2021 as Arlene Lamazo Day in the town of Greenwich and urge all of our citizens to join me in congratulating Arlene on an outstanding career and her dedication and service to the town of Greenwich. Congratulations, Arlene. Our, our moderator pro tem, Alexis Fulgaris. Thank you very much. Moderator Byrne, may I ask you to take a seat over there, please, so that you're in front. Just, you know, in the front. Over there. No. Just sit in the front. <laughs> Thank you. For the last 26 years, Thomas J. Byrne has served as the moderator 
for the Greenwich RTM. And this evening, we would like to take some time to honor him and thank him for his decades of service. Now, if you know the moderator, you know that in addition to being a brilliant parliamentarian, he's also very modest and humble about his contributions to the RTM. And so naturally, he did not want any fanfare over his departure. In fact, I pretty much promised him that there would be no fanfare while making sure that my fingers and toes were crossed the entire time. I was nodding my head saying, of course, whatever you want, knowing that all the while I was not going to listen to anything he was requesting. Moderator Byrne, as my teenage son likes to say, sorry, not sorry. I would also like to acknowledge Moderator Byrne's wife, Megan, who has joined us this evening, as well as three of his four children. And I do appreciate uh, Megan for being my co-conspirator in this over the last month. So moderator Byrne, I encourage you to make yourself comfortable while we spend the next few moments honoring you and your storied RTM career. <laughs> Yeah, you can come on down. We've got a whole row for you. <laughs> you can have the whole row. <laughs> That's Daniel. I would now like to welcome Ed Dadakis to the podium to offer some remarks. Thank you, moderator pro tem, um, members of the RTM, good evening. You know, as Tom got up to walk back there, I had never thought of Tom as one of the bashful type, and clearly he wasn't, so that's good. Um, in November, I was elected to my 21st RTM term. And doing, during those 42 years, I served under 10 different first selectmen, but I've only served under two moderators. And by the way, only two town clerks. So as Tom ends his tenure tonight as moderator and Carmen's tenure as town clerk winds down, it is indeed the end of an era for the RTM worthy of a celebration of gratitude. While those 10 first selectmen all came before us to advocate for things they wanted and argue to the RTM why we should approve them, that is exactly what the moderator does not do. Now, I know this is going to come as a surprise to a lot of you, but Tom has some strong opinions. <laughs> Yet I never heard a single one of them uttered from this podium. Tom knows the moderator's job is to subserviate his own opinion, but to make absolutely certain that our opinion and the opinion of the townspeople are heard. Tom, you can be rightly proud that you made sure all opinions were welcome in these meetings. Now, being moderator is much more than standing at this podium each meeting. But I am told that when you look at Tom's record as moderator, he has stood at this podium for the equivalent of 25 consecutive days. And there are a lot of shells here. And Tom swears, he swears that he never hit a bottle on one of these shells just to get through the night. Every month, Tom dealt with 232 diverse, strong, unique personalities who are sure they knew best. That would of course be you fine folks. Uh, and during this time, we've had some pretty interesting characters. And rather than naming them, I'm gonna ask each of you just to take a second to imagine some of the strongest, most colorful personalities you remember from RTM. You know the ones I mean. Tom, I bet you have an interesting list. And while occasionally they might make things a little hot, 
Tom managed every one of them effectively, making sure their actions were appropriate and not overdone, always protecting the decorum of the RTM. And Tom presided over some meaningful changes of RTM operations. My personal favorite is the implementation of the consent calendar speeding us through routine item approvals. My one complaint, Tom, you really didn't use it enough. I was waiting for that one meeting that it would all be on the consent calendar. Maybe tonight? Maybe tonight, okay. Um, when Tom first joined the RTM, WGCH was the prime source of RTM meetings, broadcasting live with a microphone here at the podium, both for us and the speakers over there. And then Tom guided us through the transition from radio to live television. We also thank Paul Curtis for that. And for those of you who watch the replays in high definition, and I know a lot of you do, you know how photogenic Tom can be in high definition. And today, technology advancement continues as many of you out there are Zooming from God knows where. And yes, you people in Florida, I'm talking to you. As the pandemic hit, Tom made it indisputably clear that the RTM was not going to be sidelined with long, as long as Tom Byrne was moderator. He embraced Zoom and voted, had us all voting by email. Now, we all remember that first meeting, right? It was a little slow. It was a little awkward. And some even had the nerve to complain about Tom's choice of music. Yet through it all, we conducted town business. Tom went on to fine tune those Zoom meetings, and now we are a lean, mean, Zooming machine. And the best product of Zoom meetings, more RTM members than ever attend. Tom, did you ever think you and I would see a day when 228 members were participating in an RTM meeting. Well, we only had 228 that day. We had 230? Okay, I stand corrected by the moderator. 230, 100%, okay. And they voted too. And also more people are sharing their opinions because we're on Zoom and hence we got that two minute rule. But I think when you reflect on Tom's 22 years as moderator, we can see, say he exerted effective leadership, often quietly, sometimes loudly, accomplishing much and preserving the effectiveness and the respect of the largest local legislative body in America. He has left his mark on the RTM and the town of Greenwich. And I know while you'll be joining us down here in the cheap seats next month, we all owe him a debt of gratitude for all he has done for us on the RTM. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ed. I would now like to welcome Mike Mason, former RTM member, BET chair, and now our labor negotiator. Hello, Mr. Moderator. So good evening, Mr. Moderator, family, members, and guests. The people of Greenwich tonight need to pause and recognize and thank Moderator Thomas J. Byrne for his continued service on a representative town meeting. Since 1998, he's been a member and served as moderator since 1996. Being asked to shed some reflections on Tom's incredible service, I ask myself, who is Tom Byrne? Tom is a man of commitment with a love for this community. His meeting attendance records will never be ever, ever surpassed. His attention to parliamentary governance and understanding Robert's rules with a great respect and belief in our government system that we have here in Greenwich gives him a drive to make him the strongest pillar in his community. But I'll get back to Tom in a minute. So Mr. Moderator, as Neil Diamond said, where it began. It was 1988, Tobin was moderator. Everett Smith was moderator pro tem. Margonaut was at the helm in the first selectman seat. Hicks was selectman. Some guy named Edward Lamont was a selectman, but 
he moved on to a little higher aspirations these days. Three months into your first term, you were serving on the education committee with Harold Metz, his leadership, and you got to see your first sense of the meeting resolution, the first of many. How many? To date, there was an interesting resolution on your very third meeting. It was about the town of Greenwich needing a housing authority resolution. That was 1988. What year is it this year that we did that? I think you had a crystal ball. That same March meeting, there were 17 individual RTM interim appropriations, a total of 34 in your first 12 months. Somehow I think changes over time. That's why we don't see that anymore. Capital projects, we started the sewer plant at 13 million. You made it through your first $160 million town budget of which 41 million was for the schools. That, that, our, that June, the RTM again tabled a housing trust resolution. You got your first chance to work with some of the town leaders, some of the best town leaders we, we've ever had. Mir Bergen was town attorney, and I think you've worked with five town attorneys since then. Anderson was the police chief, and you've worked with six police chiefs since then. Titsworth was fire chief, and five chiefs has followed. Ernest Fleischman was superintendent of schools. I, I didn't count up the superintendents. 3,800 times, right hands were put up for people to swear into the RTM. And you have served with 55. BET members, of which that makes up one third of the entire BET history to date. And back then, Peter Tessie was starting off and he was a, a alternate member on the Legislative and Rules Committee. And there was a fellow in the town clerk's office named Roland Harris, who was about to step down to see another career start for Camilla Butkins as town clerk. So then you were inspired to run for moderator. So we fast forward to 1996. Three rounds of voting here that night, I was here. And you won that evening over Joan Caldwell, but actually you didn't win, the town won. You and Joan created leadership to show us professionalism, teamwork and, and commitment to the town. It was a great night. So your first term, 36 interim appropriations. Could you imagine that today? Your first budget meeting as moderator, you had 29 separate motions to modify the recommended budget coming from the BET. Nine of them passed, and you re we reduced $1.1 million. That year, Dick Kriske was in his first year as chair of the BET. He had a pretty good workout. Firefighting forces in the town, 1996, were increased. There's that crystal ball again. I think we're, I think we're on to something with that again. School construction. In your first term, you had to get a building committee set up for Central, Dundee, Eastern Junior High, North Street, and you, we had set up building committees for all of those projects. North Miana School and Riverside School had ongoing uh, building committees, but they needed more money for those projects. I think that might've been the start of the future with some of our other projects. And Dean Goss got elected to every building committee. Capital projects, we were up to $24 million at sewer plant phase two. And that year you accepted 10 public private partnership gifts. Must be the inspiration our first selectman Fred, Fred Camillo goes with now. And the RTM was having a dialogue and an argument. You had to navigate through something about the parking fund. Well, we, we finished the conversation. We also finished off the parking fund. Sensitive meeting resolution, the last one that you had in your first term was a little sensitive meeting resolution about playing field priorities. That was back then. We're probably still having that today. So enough with the history for a moment. <clears throat> Except for the fact that how you got us through COVID should be a documentary film we should all make and, and be proud of. Let's get back to the Tom who. The answer is very clear. The town needed a leader, and Thomas J. Byrne was the answer to that call. Tom, we all owe you a sincere bit of gratitude for your and appreciation. The 562 regular and special RTM meeting among your district meetings, committee meetings, claim committee meetings, orientation meetings, and all the other committees, we figured you got called out over a thousand times to scheduled meetings. Never mind that thing that came up during your tenure called emails. Something, I don't know, something popped up. But we really owe your family a gratitude. They shared you with us. And that is your commitment to Greenwich, and it is truly appreciated. I'm personally thankful and honored to say some words about Tom here tonight. It's my earnest hope that we find more community members like Tom in our future. I consider myself very lucky. I was lucky to have Thomas Byrne there for me seven days a week, 24 hours a day for help in my service to the town and, and it will be sincerely appreciated. So Mr. Moderator, on behalf of the town of Greenwich, we thank you and we love you.
So when Mike and Ed and I were talking last um, Thursday about numbers, they got all the good parts. And so the only thing I had left to total was how many items you have actually uh, run through over your 26 year career. So uh, we counted 203 meetings that included regular and special and 2,776 items on the call, not including uh, the many hundreds of motions to amend, refer, postpone, points of order, the whole nine yards. Um, so that is 25 days of consecutive moderating, which I think is unprecedented. So in honor of that remarkable achievement, and since you have spent more time at the Griswold podium than anyone else, we are going to rename and rebrand the Griswold Burn Podium. And to that end, we have a lovely shiny plaque that will be affixed to the podium to commemorate your years of service. So there you go. Great, there's more. <laughs> uh, I would now like to acknowledge our state Senator, Ryan Fazio, who has something to offer you. Come on down, Ryan. Good evening. On behalf of the Connecticut General Assembly, including uh, the members of the Greenwich delegation, which include Representative Kim Fiorello, a former member of this body, Representative Stephen Mesker is a current member of this body, Harry Aurora and myself. I would like to offer this citation in recognition of your faithful service as a member of the Greenwich Representative Town Meeting since 1988, where you served with distinction as moderator since 1996. Our town is thankful for your leadership and tireless work leading one of the largest legislative bodies in the United States for a generation. Greenwich will always remember your steady hand and contribution to our local democratic process. I first met our moderator many years ago when he was umpiring and, and refereeing local sports events. And I was talking to our first selectman today about that because he was also an umpire. And, and Fred remarked that uh, he remembered you, among other things, as being one of the best, most high quality uh, referees and umpires we had in this town. And ironically, that's also how I remembered you. And it demonstrates, first of all, that your contribution to this community has gone beyond uh, as an elected official. It's broad. This is really your home and you've given your heart and soul to it. But also, it shows that you you hold the the characteristic of fairness, which is necessary not only as a referee, but also in public service as a leader. Um, democracy is the best form of government, but it also requires good people with a steady hand in order for it to deliver positive results. And this town has been very, very fortunate to have at the helm of the third largest legislative body in the United States after the US House of Representatives and the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Someone with a steady hand, judiciousness and prudence leading it for 25 years. And while we'll certainly miss you in that role, um, you've left an indelible mark on our town that we're always going to be fortunate to have and which will serve as a model for public service for many years to come. So thank you again, Mr. Moderator uh, and all the best. I'd now like to welcome um, both Lauren Rabin and Fred Camillo up to the podium to uh, present our final award of the evening for the moderator. Okay, uh, whereas Thomas J. Byrne, a graduate of Yale University and Stanford Law School moved to Greenwich in 1984 with his wife, Megan, and together they raised their four children, Joseph, Daniel, Michael, and Christina in Old Greenwich. And whereas Tom first joined the representative town meeting in January, 1988, as a delegate to the education committee and went on to serve three terms as chair of district six. And whereas in January, 1996, Tom was elected to serve as the sixth moderator of the Greenwich RTM. 
And whereas after 26 years, Tom holds the distinction of being the longest serving moderator in the history of Greenwich RTM. And during his tenure, he never missed a meeting. Now, therefore, on behalf of Fred Camillo or with Fred Camillo, first selectman of the town of Greenwich, I do proclaim Thursday, December 16th, 2021, as Thomas J. Burn Day in the town of Greenwich and urge all of our citizens and employees to enjoy to join me in congratulating Tom and for an outstanding career and his dedication and service to the town of Greenwich. I too just want to say a few words. I apologize for uh, being a little bit late, but uh, a few of us were uh, out of town for a few days, and uh, but we cut it short to make sure we we're here tonight for a special night, uh, not only on behalf of the town of Greenwich, but also as a former member of this body. Um, to salute somebody who was its fiercest defender. Uh, every once in a while, when there was this move to cut it down a little bit, you were the first one to defend it. And uh, to be here for 26 years and not miss a meeting, and I repeat, not miss a meeting for 26 years, those are Lou Gehrig, Cal Ripken type numbers. And uh, you know, it's certainly, you'll certainly be missed and you were fair. Um, even when you didn't always agree with people, uh, you were fair and you went by the book and that will truly be your legacy. And uh, I'm just glad that I was a part of it for three and a half terms uh, during your tenure. So uh, congratulations, thank you, and all the best to you, Tom. Um, there will be cake afterwards, so we'll be serving cake for all of our honorees. We invite you to stay. And now the podium, the Burn Griswold podium is all yours. There you go. I want to thank my family for coming. Now, I have nothing prepared, so um, I'm not going to take up any further time, but other than to say that Alexis Volgaris is dead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we do have, we do have uh, another long serving individual to honor tonight, and I'd like to call back Ed Didakis. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, members of the town meeting. You know, some refer to Greenwich as the gateway to New England. If you cho chose a gateway to Greenwich, it would have to be the town clerk's office and our beloved town clerk, Carmen Butkins. When Carmen called me this fall to tell me she had decided to retire, I was both sad and happy. Sad for our town that she was departing but happy for her because she has most certainly earned a long, happy and healthy retirement. I first got to know Carmen when Dolly Powers suggested she would be a good vice chairman for me the year I was the Republican campaign chairman. I called her on that advice totally out of the blue. And after a 90 minute conversation, I was certain I had a new friend. And I was right. That friendship has endured for almost four decades. The job of town clerk isn't simple, as it involves managing the very lifeblood of Greenwich, its documents and records. When you are born, when you die, when you marry, when you buy a house, when you sell a house, and numerous other events in our lives are chronicled by the town clerk's office for posterity and for inquiring minds everywhere. 
As the RTM clerk, she and her staff are in charge of all the information that we RTM members get, preparing the call and the explanos, as well as managing the meeting's voting tabulation and working to get us minutes which accurately reflect what happened. Sometimes we forget how much work that involves because Carmen and her staff make it look so easy. And you know those nights when the agenda is packed and you and I might sneak out a little bit early? Not Carmen. Every meeting, she is here until the bitter end. And much as with Tom, Carmen has embraced technology and has truly brought the RTM into the 21st century by computerizing all of the information we need. Now, a simple click of the mouse, and you can find out all about our RTM meetings. It sounds easy today, right? But it took a lot of work to get there. But my enduring memory of Carmen's role with the RTM is when at the start of each term, she stands here at the moderator's podium, it's actually up there, to gavel in the new RTM, administer the oath of office, and preside over the election of the moderator. Carmen has done an amazingly effective job. I guess that's why she has won all those elections. Yet Carm Carmen's hallmark is her ability to get along with everyone. Every single person, RTM member or not, who walked into Carmen Butkins' office over the past 30 years, found themselves, as I did, a friend. She treats everyone with respect, thoughtfulness, and responds quickly and efficiently with whatever they need. With Carmen as town clerk, our town hall was always welcoming. That is what differentiates her as an extraordinary town clerk. You know, if you're leaving a legacy, and she is, that's the kind of legacy to leave. I have been honored to call Carmen my friend, my vice chairman, and my town clerk. Carmen, thank you for all you have done for Greenwich and the RTM. Thank you, Ed. Uh, we are now joined by Peter Testi on Zoom. Is Mr. Testi with us? There we go. Welcome, Peter. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Uh, let me just offer my congratulations and thanks to you for your extraordinary service to Greenwich. You're a true statesman, and it was a real honor to serve with you and at the RTM under your leadership. Best wishes. Likewise. Thank you very much. I'm joining you tonight to also add some personal thanks and gratitude to my dear friend, Carmela Butkins. Uh, Carm Butkins and I go back to the earliest days of serv my service in town government. And in many respects, I would never have served in town government had not been for Carm. Frankly, early on in, in my engagement, uh, many people thought I was one of Carm's children. Um, you know, do you want to talk about dynasty? That would have been quite an interesting scenario if I was. Um, but Carm spoke to the heart of Greenwich. Everything that she did, she did to help her fellow human being. Uh, she saw things in terms of people, not in terms of politics. And that to me has been her hallmark. She always put people first, no matter what the endeavor was, uh, whether it was serving the RTM, serving on the town's board of health, um, engaged with the attorneys, with the general public who have very personal, intimate matters that came before her office. She always treated them with a welcome, welcoming smile and a eagerness to help them get done what they needed to do in her office. And 
Greenwich has been well served by her leadership. We've been fortunate to have someone of her care and concern. And my hope and wish for her is that she has a long and enjoyable retirement with her husband, John, her three children, and her five grandchildren. Um, and that she gets to turn the page and live a beautiful uh, next chapter uh, as fulfilling as the one that she's concluding um, over the next three weeks. So Carm, my best wishes to you. God bless you. Thank you for all you have done for this town, for the institutions, and for being the wonderful, lovable person that you are. Thank you, and God bless you. Arm, I'd like to invite you to the podium. We have, and also if uh, for Selectman Camillo would come up and select woman Lauren Rabin would come up. Thank you very much. You get to stay here. Okay, stay here. And they're gonna. Okay. Back. All right. Whereas Carmela, calm, calm, sorry, you are calm. <laughs> you are very calm. Buckins was elected town clerk and began her first of her 15 terms in January 1991, being the first female town clerk in the town's history. And whereas Carm is a Greenwich native, graduated from Greenwich High School and has many community affiliations, including the Chickahominy Neighborhood Association, Community Centers, Inc., Greenwich Board of Health, Greenwich Pub Republican Town Committee, Hamilton Avenue School PTA and Parent Council, St. Rock's Church, as well as the Fairfield County of Town Clerks Association. Whereas during her 30 year tenure as town clerk, she implemented technology that streamlines the process of recording documents efficiently for our customers and online images dating back to 1936. And whereas she formed the Town of Greenwich Preservation Committee to plan and implement a program to conserve the town's original manuscript record books, the town's earliest records dating back <coughs> to 1640 that have been preserved and stored in the town vault. And whereas Carm is married to John, the mother of three children and grandmother of five, and whereas as of December 31st, 2021, Carm is retiring as town clerk, leaving a legacy of service to the town and now, therefore, on behalf of Fred Camillo, first selectman of the town of Greenwich, I do proclaim Tuesday, December 14th, 2021, as Carm Buckins Day in the town of Greenwich and urge all citizens to join me in applauding Carm's many years of dedicated service to the town and wishing her many years of health and happiness in her retirement and future endeavors. Well, just as uh, Tom has been the face of the RTM for over almost three decades, uh, CARM too has been the face of the town clerks, a friendly face that uh, for 30 years has been a, really a great resource for all of us. I know whenever I came back into town hall, I always said I wanted to, no matter where I was going, I wanted to stop and see her for five minutes, which usually turned in to about an hour. And <laughs> You certainly kept everybody informed. I'm sure everybody has similar stories, but uh, you know we've known each other for a long time, sort of like family. So uh, you know, on behalf of everybody in Greenwich, thank you for all you've done. Uh, and I'm wishing you the best of health and happiness in your retirement, but uh, we know you're not going away and uh, we'll be calling on you on other things. So God bless.
Well, like Tom, I have nothing prepared. This is totally a surprise. And from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you to all of you. Um, it's been wonderful reminiscing. I couldn't have done the 30 years without my great staff who are all here tonight, except for Vitals. I don't know, they're not here. But uh, the job never stops. As I was sitting waiting for the meeting to start, a lawyer called me tonight and said, uh, my uh, client just passed away in, in Greenwich, but he lives in Stanford. So where do I get his death certificate? And we have it, it's in Greenwich. You know what they say, we do everything from birth to death and everything in between. And it has been certainly a lot of in between. Uh, Judge Tobin stopped in to see me a few weeks ago to say goodbye. He's retired. He's going to uh, Florida. And we reminisced about his time that we spent together on RTM. And I just want to thank Tom Byrne for the 26 years. I remember the night that you were elected. And we had um, Roger Laurie as a moderator pro tem. And then uh, we had Joan Caldwell, of course, who would come in the office all the time and make sure everything was up on the bulletin board. And today we have Alexis, and I'm sure she will continue on. But I just wanted to say that I could not have done anything without the support of everyone in town. Always remember what a great place Greenwich is and what a great place Town Hall is. We are blessed to have the people that we have had in the past and today, and hopefully in the future. So thank you again, and I wish you all a very happy and healthy holiday and new year. Thank you. It has indeed been a privilege to work with CARM during my entire tenure as moderator, and I, I thank CARM and her office for all they have done for the RTM. And I wish CARM all the best in her retirement. All right, believe it or not, we're ready to uh, continue with our meeting. Um, <clears throat> we did take care of the minutes, I believe. All right, so I, uh, I notified, first of all, um, I'm going to send my family on their way. Thank you all for coming there. <laughs> I, I greatly appreciate it. All right, we had eight items on our agenda tonight. Uh, item six has been withdrawn, leaving us to dispose of seven items tonight. I informed our district and committee chairs that uh, I would recommend based upon the reports received, putting five of those seven, I'm sorry, Ed, on our consent calendar. Uh, those would be the first five all appointments, leaving items seven and eight to be taken up separately. So. So at this point, I will now pursuant to our rules, designate the following five items for our consent calendar. If they remain on the consent calendar, all you will hear tonight on them is what I'm about to say, as we do not uh, get committee reports or have discussion of consent calendar items. The first item is item number one. This is the appointment of Norma Curlin to be a regular member of Inland Wetlands and Watercourses, one word, of agency for a term expiring October 31, 2022. Item two is the appointment of Peter Lindroth to be a regular member of Binland Wetlands and Watercourses, one word for a term expiring October 31, 2025. Item three is the appointment of Matthew Bernard to be an alternate member of the Historic District Commission for a term expiring October 31, 2026. Item four is the appointment of Alan Harris to be a regular member of the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses, one word, for a term expiring October 31, 2024. 
Then item five is a resolution appointing Robert Barillac to be an alternate member of the Planning and Zoning Commission for a term expiring October 31, 2024. Is there any objection to the designation of those five items for our consent calendar? Hearing none, will our uh, district tabulators please mark your voting cards, consent calendar items one through five and proceed to poll your delegation. We will, we will allow five minutes for that voting to occur. Okay. All right. So um, we are we're still waiting for the uh, the final result of that vote. But at this point, we will continue with the business of the meeting. Um, the next item to come before us is a uh, petition signed by twenty or more registered voters. Um, Kit Bergweger, are you presenting this item? Uh, yes, Mr. Moderator, uh, resolved you. that it is the sense of the meeting that candidates for moderator and moderator pro tem of the 2022-2023 representative town meeting file their names with a brief statement of their qualifications with the town clerk on or before noon of December 23, 2021 for inclusion uh, in the call of the January 18, 2022 meeting. Thank you. Will the member please move the adoption of the resolution? Resolution on item seven has been moved and seconded. Mr. Bergweger, uh, with the report of our legislative interviews committee. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Moderator, Mrs. Moderator Pro Tem, uh, members of the legislative, uh, members of the uh, RTM. Um, this is a this is a, a matter that has been a. a resolution that has been introduced and, and adopted uh, each of the past five terms uh, so that members of the RTM know the qualifications and abilities of uh, the candidates for these two offices. Um, at the Legislative Rules Committee meeting, there was a question about this, which was uh, described in the report of the meeting as that the uh, rule, what the question was whether, the, by the way, we didn't have a rule that had already provided this. And it was reported that it had been considered before, but had not been passed. Some people uh, understood that to mean that the RTM had considered it, but that was not correct. That it was either at committee level or perhaps um, task force that were developing proposed rules, it's not quite clear, but it, it is, has never come before the RTM in the form of a rule which was rejected. So it has always been adopted as a resolution in the form that it is today, except that in sometimes a few extra words have been added, but basically this is the, the uh, form. Um, the problem that we have now is we have a second reading rule and this comes by petition. So it won't become effective if it's adopted until January, which isn't going to be very useful. So legislative and rules move, take, approved a motion to um, suspend the second reading rule and then to approve this summer. So our votes on the motion to suspend the second reading rule uh, was uh, 1010. We considered the legal order of the matter, which was passed unanimously, and a vote on the merits passed with 830 with districts 1, 5, and 9. Voting no, no due to the concerns about the potential that this might have the effect of discouraging candidates who will decide to run later. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I'll make the uh, motion at the appropriate time. If this is not it, I'll do it later. Thank you. Brian Rainey, District 9. This is now discussion on item seven. Brian Rainey.
Thank you, Mr. Bergwer already uh, stated the points. Are you have nothing to say? No. Thank you. I'm sorry, I can't I can't hear you. Is that a yes? You, you signed I up have to nothing further to say, Mr. Bergwerger covered the points. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Bergwerger, I'll recognize you now. On behalf of the Legislative and Rules Committee, I move that we suspend the second reading rule and vote. Take the final vote on this matter at tonight's meeting. All right. So, as Mr. Bergweger explained, we have um, we have adopted the RTM has adopted a resolution um, encouraging any candidates for moderator moderator pro tem to declare their candidacy in time to be included in the call for the January meeting for the last five terms. This would be the sixth. This is the sixth time this is before us. In all other five times, it was overwhelmingly approved, some cases in December. Uh, but since our last um, term, we have this second read rule that requires any petition, any matter that comes to us by petition of registered voters uh, to automatically come back a second time unless we suspend the rule to do that, which... Uh, Mr. Bergweger and the Legislative and Rules Committee has just recommended we do so that we get the benefit of this um, and any interested candidates would then be encouraged to declare um, this month. That uh, motion to suspend requires a two-thirds vote of uh, members present and voting. I will in the first instance call for a raised hand vote if we need to take a record vote, we will do that. But uh, let us let us try and be more efficient. Um, so only members may participate in this vote. Um, Ms. Volgaris, you want to take care of counting uh, those present in the room. Um, so at this time, if you are in favor of deciding, you know, adopting this or rejecting it finally tonight, you should, um, if, if you want to adopt it finally tonight, you should vote in favor of suspending the rules. If you don't want to suspend the rules and require this to come back in January, which um, would come after the election of our moderator, moderator pro tem, you should vote no. So all those in favor of suspending <clears throat> the rule that this be subject to a second read, please raise your hand now. Right. All right, all hands down. If you are opposed to suspending the rule for a second read, uh, <clears throat> you should raise your hand now. All right, so we had 125 yeses, we have 35 noes. Uh, that is more than a two thirds majority. So that motion to spend the rules has carried. All right, we will now proceed to vote on the merits of item seven. If you are in favor of encouraging, so um, I will call for a vote. We will take a record vote on this. If you are in favor of encouraging, encouraging any candidates for moderator, moderator pro tem to declare their candidacy 
um, in time for inclusion in the January call, you will vote yes. If you are opposed to that, you vote no. I ask the district tabulators to please conduct the voting of their delegations. And again, we'll give five minutes for that process. I, I do have the result of the vote on our consent calendar items. Those were items one through five. Those in favor, 197, opposed, zero, abstaining, one. The consent calendar items have carried. All right, so that's our uh, five minute period for conducting the voting on item seven. We will bring the results when we have them. All right, that now brings us to our final agenda item tonight. And that is a petition item. Is uh, Carl Higby with us? Who is presenting this item for the petitioners? Is Mr. Higby with us on Zoom or Gladstone? All right, uh, Mr. Higby, I'm assuming you are the uh, presenter. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right, so uh, I'll spare you the details. This item is essentially designed to give parents the choice over whether or not your kids are masked when they attend school. It does not ban them. It does not tell you have to use them. It says the parents have the choice with them and their medical provider. That is it. Thank you. And that is a proposed ordinance, and it is as it appears on the call. Um, will a member please move the adoption of the resolution on item eight? It has been moved and seconded. Uh, this item has been moved and seconded. Now, tonight, and this item gives me an opportunity to discuss some basic parliamentary procedure. There are... There are certain requirements simply to get an item on the RTM call. The uh, charter provides that the moderator may place items on the call for selectmen and the chair of the BET. The other way to get items on the call are by way of petition of 20 or more registered voters. Putting a petition on the call is a ministerial act if the petition, if the signatures are valid, it automatically goes on the call without any review at that time. Then the item is presented to the body at an RTM meeting, which item eight now has been. And as with any call resolution or motion, there are three things that now must take place to put this before you. The motion has to be moved which this has, it has to be seconded, which this has. And then it has to essentially be accepted by the chair. And what that process is called, the chair states the question on the motion. The item is not before the body to deal with until that third step has taken place. And the way we typically do it here, rather than read the entire thing, <clears throat> you hear the chair say, the resolution on item number five has been moved and seconded. That is the third step that actually places this before you. You have not heard that from me tonight. And the reason is this. I'm now reading from section 415 of the current edition of Robert's Rules, which explains the stating of the question by the chair. And it begins, when a motion that is in order has been made and seconded, the chair formally places it before the assembly by stating the question. It has to be in order for it to be accepted and the chair state the question. Robert's rules <clears throat> then goes on to say, in principle, the chair must state the question on a motion immediately after it has been made and seconded, 
unless he is obliged to rule that the motion is not in order or unless, in his opinion, the wording is not clear. So as a matter of parliamentary procedure, your RTM moderator cannot accept a motion that would have the RTM take action in excess of its authority. So um, knowing there were questions about the legal order of this item, I asked our law department to research it and give us an opinion as to whether this item is in order. And as um, has been true and as must be true for a body to act within its authority, if we get a legal opinion from the law department that an item is not in legal order, your chair cannot accept the item. This is not a decision I am making. I'm relying on the opinion of our law department, and I will now ask the law department to share their opinion with the members. Amina Ahmad, Assistant Town Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, Madam Moderator Pro Tem, uh, members of the RTM. Um, yes, the moderator had asked the law department uh, to review the uh, proposed ordinance and to give an opinion uh, as to its legal order. Uh, for those of you who attended the committee meetings, you heard the presentation on that. Um, and I will start by saying that in the opinion of the law department, uh, the proposed ordinance is not in legal order. And uh, I, I can explain that a little bit further if this would be the right time for it. Um, as the moderator mentioned um, just a few minutes ago, the RTM acts within certain constraints that are placed on it by the charter, the state law, state statutes, and specifically uh, section 167 of the town charter uh, says that RTM authority is to be exercised in conformity with the law. So the question then becomes, uh, what is the law that we're speaking about uh, that the RTM must act in conformity with uh, when we have this ordinance before us. Um, we've all been living through the COVID-19 pandemic uh, since the beginning of last year, and you're all familiar with executive orders uh, that have come down from the governor's office. Uh, and so looking at this ordinance, there are several executive orders uh, which govern whether or not uh, this uh, ordinance is in legal order. Um, the executive order started out in uh, September of last year regarding masking and have continued through uh, the fall of this year. And in particular, there are three executive orders, uh, Executive Order 9, Executive Order 13A, and then Executive Order 14, 14A, excuse me. Uh, and essentially uh, what the governor has done with uh, the issuance of these executive orders is uh, that the governor's office has given the authority to the State Department of Education and the State Department of Public Health to issue binding orders and regulations uh, with regard to where masks are to be mandated. And for purposes of our discussion this evening, uh, the State Department of Education and the Department of Public Health under those executive orders that I just mentioned did in fact issue binding orders and regulations and rules with regard to whether masks are required in public and private schools. Uh, and what they have done through, uh, again, as I said, those two state departments, as well as the commissioner of public health, uh, is that they have mandated that all public school districts uh, as well as private schools uh, in the state of Connecticut are required to have children who attend any of these schools wear masks. And I'm, I'm really paraphrasing there because uh, the documents which 
provide these uh, binding orders are quite lengthy. Again, for purposes of our discussion here, uh, they have mandated that masks are required uh, in both public and private schools. Now, within those orders, they have also set out uh, situations where parents can go in uh, and ask for exemptions from those specific schools uh, based on, on various criteria. So there are exemptions built in, uh, but the uh, binding rules that have come down from the state through these executive orders is that masks are mandated. Uh, and when you look at the ordinance that's being proposed, uh, it essentially says uh, that the uh, that that the it's asking this body and the town uh, not to enforce state or federal orders, regulations, or statutes uh, requiring masks or face coverings for children uh, within both the public and private school system. So, um, looking at the executive orders and the rulings that have come down from uh, the State Department of Public Health uh, and the State Department of Education, just looking at those by themselves, uh, it is the opinion of the law department that if this body were to approve the ordinance that's before you uh, and, and, and it became a town ordinance, it, 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 before you even get to that, the ordinance as proposed uh, is not in legal order. Um, there was some discussion at some of the committee meetings uh, that, that went to the validity of some of these executive orders, uh, and really the way to challenge those executive orders would be uh, for somebody to go to court and challenge the governor's authority to issue those executive orders. Uh, as I mentioned at some of the committee meetings, those challenges have occurred. Uh, trial courts have ruled on the validity of these executive orders and of other executive orders that have been issued uh, by the governor. Um, so again, we're looking at the existing executive orders. Uh, and, and another question that was asked was, well, is this written in a state statute? Um, as many of you know, uh, the law isn't just simply looking at a state statute. Uh, the executive orders are, are deemed to be uh, and have the effect and force of law, and they have been upheld by trial courts in the state. Um, when you look at what the body of law is, you're also looking at court decisions, you're looking at rules and regulations uh, that various state departments issue, uh, which is again, another piece of what we're talking about uh, this evening. Uh, the other reason that I had mentioned uh, that this ordinance as proposed would not be in legal order is the RTM is acting um, uh, on behalf of the town. Uh, but you have the Board of Education, which uh, is, is required to follow the rulings and the orders that come down from the State Department of Education, as well as the State Department of Public Health. Uh, and it really goes to their jurisdiction, meaning the jurisdiction of the Board of Education, to really decide uh, what goes on within the buildings. And in fact, Based on the executive orders, the local Board of Education here in Greenwich has adopted policies regarding masking in schools. Uh, so it is our opinion uh, that the Board of Education oversees what goes on within the school system, the public school system, and it wouldn't be within the domain of the town to pass an ordinance which then one uh, goes against what the executive orders have allowed uh, and have mandated, and two, uh, really stepping into uh, the jurisdiction and the domain of the Board of Education to uh, regulate how the schools are run and how the buildings uh, and rules are enforced within the buildings as it uh, pertains to the students who attend our schools. Uh, so I've probably said too much, but uh, I've tried to summarize 
uh, sort of in, in, in a straightforward way, I hope, uh, why it is the opinion of the law department that the ordinance that's being proposed uh, is not in legal order. Thank you. All right, as I said, as Robert's rules <clears throat> clearly points out, there are times when the chair is obliged not to put the question before the body, and that's when the item is not in order. Decisions on legal order are made in the first instance by our town attorney and the law department that the town attorney supervises. We have now heard that opinion. The RTM has a rule that when any member shall state a clear and substantial question of law as to an item of business before the meeting and shall request opinion of counsel thereon, there the request shall have precedence and shall be referred immediately to the town attorney. That is what I did. Um, and this is in section three of our rules under a meeting procedure and uh, subsection I for point of information. So the request has a preference as a point of information. The rule goes on to say, if after an opinion is given, any member shall appeal therefrom, the question may, by majority vote of those present, be referred to the Legislative and Rules Committee for further study and conference with the town attorney and a report at the next regular meeting. I understand, Mr. Higby, uh, you intended to appeal that opinion of the town attorney, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Moderator, it is. All right, so I will recognize you in a moment, but let me just explain um, what, what will happen. So. Mr. Higby will, under that provision of our rule, appeal the town attorney's opinion that item eight is not in legal order, which forces the chair not to accept the item and place it before the body. Um, the rule, we've never, we've never invoked this rule in, in my tenure on the RTM, um, either as a member or as moderator. Um, so, we are bound by the provision of the rule, which is we will take a vote. This will be debatable, uh, but the issue will be on the legal order opinion of the town attorney, not on the efficacy of masks for, for children. But you heard the basis for the opinion. That is, that is what any debate will be constrained to discuss. Um, and then we'll take a vote. And um, majority will determine whether this goes to the legislative and rules to study in consultation with the law department and to report back in January. So if a majority were to uh, support referring this to legislative and rules, that is what will happen. And legislative and rules would come back in January, present their report, and then a majority of the membership would decide the issue. This is not something that legislative and rules would decide. They would just study, make a recommendation, and then uh, the majority in January would decide that issue. But before any of that can happen, there must be a majority vote to refer this to legislative and rules. So I hope that is clear. Mr. Higby, at, at this point, I will recognize you. Uh, ex excuse me. Um, at this point, I'm going to recognize Tom Broadhurst who uh, informed me that he had a motion he wanted to make regarding debate at this point in the meeting. Ms. Broadhurst. Mr. Moderator, I move that we limit debate on this item to 30 minutes with no speaker taking more than 90 seconds. All right, <clears throat> Mr. Broadhurst has moved to limit debate to a total time of 30 minutes with individual speakers limited to 90 seconds each. Is there a second? All right, a motion to limit debate is not itself debatable, 
and requires a two thirds majority to pass. If you are in favor of the limit proposed by Mr. Broadhurst, you should vote yes. And again, in the first instance, I will uh, call for a raised hand vote. Ms. Volgaris, if you could supervise counting in person. Again, only members may participate in the vote. If you are opposed to any limit, you should vote no. So all hands down. At this point, if you are in favor of the limit proposed by Mr. Broadhurst, please raise your hand now. All right, all hands down, please. Those who are opposed to the proposed limit, please raise your hand now. You have two. All right, we had 136 in favor. We have 28 against. Again, that is more than a two thirds. So that motion to limit debate has carried. It is now in effect. Mr. Moderator, point of information. Who is speaking? Michael Spilo. What is your point of information? I'm wondering if the process uh, you outlined is the only process available to us. So if we can um, make a motion to appeal your ruling that this is the only process available to us. Oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> All right, so if a point of order is raised, now you, you raised a point of information. So um, if, a, if a point of order is raised while an appeal is pending, there's no appeal from the chair's decision on this point of order, although the correctness of the ruling can be brought up later by a motion covering the case. So we are going to first um, handle the appeal that Mr. Higby said he was making and um, after a after that has been disposed of, Mr. Spilo, I'll come back to you. Mr. Higby, you have the floor. Thank you. So uh, since we're not debating the efficacy of masks, this is about why sh this should be on the floor and why I disagree with the legal order uh, being struck down. This was um, signed by 25, well, originally 45 people, uh, we had to go back and do the signatures again. So I just got the required 28 or whatever it was. Um, I don't believe that one individual, the town attorney, should be able to dictate what we, the people, as a signature meeting criteria to get on the agenda, should be able to strike down. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem very democratic. Now, again, not going into the efficacy of mass, I don't believe this, the order from the state is in legal order because I don't think you can force somebody to put something over their face. I, this is about choice. And I want the choice of the people here tonight to make that decision. You want to wear one? Go ahead. You don't? Also don't. But this is about you being able to choose for your children what you think is best based on the doctor and you making that decision. And I think that blocking that because of a snafu on legal order is undemocratic. I think it's not the way business should be conducted because there's clearly enough attention with this if you've seen the last Board of Ed meeting. So I would appreciate that if everybody would vote for this to be furthered in debate and furthered to uh, LNR, as well as with the town attorney. Uh, I think this is an important issue that I think everybody should have the choice on and not be told what to do. Thank you, sir. 
All right. So um, we have a 30 minute total time limit in effect. We'll start that as of 936. Um, I do have a list of speed. We don't have a, a speaker list for the appeal, but we did have a speaker list for item eight on the merits. Um, I will I will call the names on that list. Now the speakers need to realize debate is limited to the opinion of the town attorney as to whether this is in legal order because it would require the RTM to take action where the RTM lacks authority, meaning any regulation of the public schools, and because the ordinance would violate existing state law. That's what the debate is now limited to. It's not whether masks are good or bad. <clears throat> it's um, would this ordinance um, cause the RTM to act in excess of its authority and violate state law? Mr. Right. Moderator, this no, is Mike Spilo. I'm not recognizing you, Mr. Spilo. The first speaker is Jackie Holman. If you don't want to Mr. speak- Mr. Moderator, on... you, you put together, uh, I sent a request to speak specifically on this item and Mr. these other people did not. Mr. Spilo, you're not recognized. Please, can we, he's not recognized to speak. Jackie Holman is the first speaker. Do you care to speak on the appeal? To be followed by Alicia Borelli. Hi, yes, thank you. I would just encourage everybody to consider that what we're going through right now is a really unusual time. The extension of Lamont's power is questionable, whether that was in legal order on its own. And so I would encourage you to think about being brave and not necessarily be beholden to some arbitrary rules when you know that all of the science and all of the information about masks says that it's harmful to our children. And so when there is a risk to our children, there needs to be a choice, whether it's in legal order or not, you really need to consider the absolutely unusual circumstances around the situation and vote for humanity. That's all. Thank you. Alicia Borelli to be followed by Adele Carroll. Unmute, please. Is Ms. Borelli here? Sorry. Hi. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to us. My name is Alicia Borelli. I've lived in Greenwich for 15 years. My eldest child went through Greenwich Public Schools. My middle guy's at the high school, and my daughter's at private school here in Greenwich. I'm a t I was a teacher for 15 years, and I have two master's degrees. Uh, parents in this town are very, very upset. The choice to cover a child's face belongs to a parent. We pay taxes. These schools are ours. I implore the RTM to take any and all action necessary to restore normalcy and health and voices and facial expressions back to the lives of our children before they lose more irreplaceable emotional, social, physical, and academic growth. That what we are doing to them is damaging and abusive. And it, I, I beg the town leaders to stand up and do something about it and and help our and help us restore parental rights. Thank you for your time. Adele Carroll to be followed by Joe Solari. No, we're not taking we're not taking questions. Joe um, Adele Carroll to be followed by Joe Solari. What? Okay, Joe Solari. Yes, sir. Thank you. And, and good evening, everyone. Uh, the mask issue certainly is divisive throughout our town, throughout our country. Uh, but you have seen states, in fact, most states that don't have these mandates. And many of the states that do have those mandates are being challenged in the courts and like in Pennsylvania being overturned. We have to stand up for what's right. And legally, ethically, in every sense of the word, masking our children is wrong. It's wrong to force masks on children, and there are legal avenues to be able to alter I, I think the I explained, sir, I'm sorry, but I explained the debate is on the legal order opinion of the town attorney, not on the efficacy of masks. And, and I, I, guess, I guess other town attorneys or state attorneys have disagreed with that opinion, hence mask mandates are being struck down. We certainly wish that the RTM takes the opportunity to strike this down 
I should strike down the town attorney's advice and pursue it further for debate and discussion. Just help our children and to do what's right. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila Philbin to be followed by um, Michelage, Jack. Sheila Philbin. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it Kara Philbin? Pardon me? Uh, is it Kara Philbin? Are you Philbin? I'm Kara Philbin. All right. Did you sign up to speak on this? Uh, yes, I did. All right. You have the floor. And I'm sorry, did you limit time? Is that what happened? 90 seconds you have. Okay. So I'll reverse the order. Okay. Thank you. Um, the fact that mask wearing presents a severe risk of harm to the wearer should, standing alone, not be required for children, particularly given that these children are not ill me, and have done. We're not, we're not discussing whether masks I'm getting, are appropriate. I'm getting, please it's, give me a moment to get to the point. The legal no, no, excuse me. It, it is, I am getting to the legal order. The legal order and the town attorney's opinion should be referred to legislative and rules or not. Okay, it, 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 give me one more sentence to get to that, please. Um, not be required for children, particularly given that these children are not ill and have done nothing wrong that would warrant an infringement of their constitutional rights and bodily autonomy. Promoting use of a non-FDA approved emergency use authorized mask is unwarranted and illegal. This mandate is in direct conflict with 21 U.S. Code and Section 360 BBB 31A Two, three, which requires the wearer to be informed of the option to refuse the wearing of such device, misrepresenting the use of a mask as being intended for antimicrobial or antiviral protection and or misrepresenting masks for use as infection prevention or reduction is a deceptive practice under the FTC. It is clear there is no waiver of liability under deceptive practices, even under a state of emergency. As such, forcing children to wear masks or similarly forcing use of any other non-FDA approved medical product without the child or the child's parental consent is illegal and immoral. As such, unmask our, chil our children, teachers, and administrators. All right, time is up. All right, I have two, two uh, Michelangelo's. Um, and I apologize. There is a Sheila Philbin who I was supposed to speak. I got the wrong one. Uh, I apologize. All right, so we have, apparently there was a misspelling. We have a Sheila Phelan. Do you, do you have a Sheila... Oh, yeah, it's, um, Sheila, um, yeah. All right, so pull up Sheila Phelan, please. Hi there, can Sheila Phelan, you have the floor, 90 seconds. Can you hear me? I yes. was um, here to speak um, against the original ordinance and about masking. I would suggest and recommend that everyone defer to the uh, the lawyer from the town of Greenwich who spoke today. Um, I feel very strongly that, and I have spoken to parents and kids about masking and they feel like it's it's not a thing. The health and well being of the community is, and it's a very small thing to do, but that's not the issue here. You're, you know, you need to decide if, you all need to decide if you're gonna take this in, in a different direction. And I would defer to the uh, legal advice you got today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have a uh, Marija Mikolajak to be followed by Laura Gladstone? Yes, hello, thank you, good evening. Um, I would just like to say that in a letter dated of April 24, 2020, the Food and Drug Administration stated that authorized face masks must be um, labeled accurately and may not be labeled in a way that misrepresents the product's intended use. And the letter specifies the labeling may not state or imply the product is intended. Um, excuse me, I'm gonna skip ahead. Any EUA mandate requiring individuals to wear face masks conflicts with section 360 BBB3E1A 
21-3, which provides that the person must be informed of the option to refuse to wear the device. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Gladstone to be followed by Kira Lynch. Kai, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Monterey. Thank you for your service. Um, just wanted to say that the opinion of the town attorney is just that, an opinion. It's not law. And many, time good many times good lawyers have opinions that are not correct or do not hold up in court. And we believe this is one of those times. Um, as it stands now, it is highly unlikely that the state would do anything in response to our town ordinance if it passed as the executive order is already under appeal for its constitutionality. Um, and especially since the state is allowing towns to make its own decision, decisions regarding masks, um, just as it is in Greenwich, it's not logical thinking that children can spend hours in restaurants and gyms and stores unmasked, but yet they have to be masked in school. And, um, you know, finally the argument whether private or public schools can enforce the ordinance is really up to the leadership of the school because there's other municipalities and private schools in the state that have decided not to enforce this mandate with no repercussions from the state. So it's really up to us. And I would really hope that our schools would be leaders here. Um, we know that children do not die from COVID. And in fact, not one child has died of COVID in Connecticut. Um, they're not maimed or harmed from COVID. So masks, on the other hand, do, in, do impede academic, social, and emotional learning um, and really hurt children from poor socioeconomic backgrounds the most. So we're asking the RTM to end. Thank you. Kira Lynch to be followed by Christina Volkwein. No, Kira Lynch, Christina Volkwein to be followed by Svetlana Wasserman. Um, how about Erica Smith? Erica Smith to be followed by Svetlana Wasserman. Yes, hello, this is Erica. You have the floor, 90 seconds. Speak. Okay, I, I don't really have much to say other than to say that I really hope, I agree that um, Lamont's mandate is not a law. Your lawyer's opinion is just an opinion. And limiting your voters, your constituents' time is really in poor taste. Clearly, this is something that needs to be discussed. And we need the floor so that we can figure out what to do. Our kids are suffering. And you guys will eventually have to hear it. So hopefully, we'll get the chance to express ourselves. Thank you. Svetlana Wasserman to be followed by Marissa Brown. Um, <clears throat> the Center for Disease Control is our nation's health protection agency working 24 seven to protect America from health threats. According to the CDC, due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, they recommend universal indoor masking by all students, staff, teachers, and visitors. The Connecticut Department of Public Health's mission is to protect and improve the health and safety of the people of Connecticut. They too require that masks be worn in schools. Yet the petitioners think that they know better than all the epidemiologists and infectious disease control specialists working at our nation's premier health agencies. They're asking us on the RTM to override the guidelines that scientists and doctors whose job it is to protect public health have recommended. While there may be some of us on the RTM with expertise in infectious diseases, we're overall a body of lay people. We don't have the expertise to second guess the judgment of people who are experts and neither do the petitioners. The petition asks that parents be allowed to make mask decisions affecting their children's health. But what it really asks is for parents to be able to make mask decisions that affect other people's health, the health of teachers and school staff and their extended families. As Abraham Lincoln put it, your freedom ends where my nose begins. I find it unfortunate that the petitioners would choose to put our entire community at risk at a time when there is a new variant that's spreading. And I hope that you will all vote against this item. All right, Marissa Brown to be followed by Lana Ferraro speaking on the appeal. Oh, all right, I'm sorry. Did I announce someone after that? 
What? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. To be followed by Beth McGillivray. Hello. Yes. Lana Ferrara. Yes. This is she. Right. Good evening. Thank you for your time to allow me to speak on behalf of my children. I have two children, one in the preschool program in the Greenwich school district and a two-year-old who will be the future student of the Greenwich school district. I am here to speak out against the mass band nakes and stand up for my children's rights. I am pleading with you all to allow this to go to the proper place to have our voices heard. We are the taxpayers, therefore we should have a voice and say in what goes on in our children's faces. The state's order is unconstitutional and it crushes the freedom of children and families. This is truly unacceptable. I am a mother of young children and I just would love to have the leaders stick up for the choices of families in the communities. Let's come together and do the right thing and give people a choice. I am begging you, I am begging to please help in any way possible. Thank you and have a great night. Beth McGillibray to be followed by Jonathan, Jonathan Perlow. Okay. Jonathan Perlow to be followed by Dana Franks. Hello, thank you. Um, the moderator's rules are not arbitrary. It's not up to the RTM to decide which statutes that we follow or don't follow. Um, so I feel if the petitioners um, feel that this mask mandate is unconstitutional, they should sue the state and not um, waste this body's time. Um, if we, you know, I'm really worried that if we continue on this route, um, you know, what's gonna stop some other voters from putting forward a petition that is obviously um, illegal and overturns perhaps constitutional rights, for example, like maybe banning private ownership of firearms. I don't think we wanna go there. And so um, this ruling should not be appealed. Thank you. Dana Franks to be followed by Cheryl Moss. No, William Sterling. Sharon Kissler. Cheryl Moss to be followed by Matthew Yardis. Matthew Yardis to be followed by Gail Lawrenson. Do we have Lawrenson? All right, to be followed by Megan Galetta. Gail, Gail Lordson has the floor. Speaking on the appeal of the town attorney's opinion. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gail Lordson, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Your law department says the RTM is not allowed to pass an ordin ordinance that violates state law. That means we are bound to blind obedience. Blind obedience is when we trust someone else's thinking above our own. Didn't Martin Luther King Jr. state that all persons have an obligation to disobey unjust laws? Didn't Thomas Aquinas say any law that degrades human personality is unjust? So we might consider debating whether masking the noses and mouths of children their very expression and communication portals degrades their personality. I ask all of you right now, sitting there, are you required to wear a mask as you sit in your seat right now? Look around. If you are not wearing a mask, why aren't you? I have loved and been proud of Greenwich every single day of the 35 years that I've lived here. We now have an opportunity to do a good thing, a historic thing by doing the hard work and making a decision that transcends blind obedience, group think. Thank you very much. Megan Galata to be followed by Steve Rubin. All right, Megan Galata is here. You may speak up at the lectern.
Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. We, the parents of Greenwich Public and private schools, are requesting that our town leaders and our town lawyers support the ordinance to allow for mass choice for our school children. We support every parent's right to make informed medical decisions for their children. I am asking the members of this body to hear our appeal so that the issue can be studied more closely. The opinion of the town attorney does not represent the opinion and all of the taxpayers and citizens and parents of this community. We are not anti-mask, we are for parental choice. There is no emergency, and in fact, our state was never in a true state of emergency. We never lacked resources to support our citizens. The long-term impact of masking children is far more detrimental than any slight chance, 99.99%, that they will fall ill. The, the toll the masks are taking on developmental physical, social, and emotional well-being of our children will be hard to unwind. We, a country founded upon grit, determination, and bravery underpinned by freedom, have reduced its citizens to live in a constant state of fear. Fear of walking out of their homes, fear of shopping in a grocery store, fear of driving in your car alone without a mask, fear of passing someone in a store or standing in line, fear of gathering with family, friends, attending religious services, fear of eating meals together and holidays and celebrations. Healthy children younger than 18 have a negligible risk of health risk from contracting COVID. Thank you for hearing us. Steve is here. Steve Rubin be followed by Carl Homan. Yeah, I, are you ready? Uh, you know, I didn't prepare anything to speak, and I so strongly urge you to accept what the town attorney has said. Um, she didn't make an opinion as an opinion. If you were at the legislative and rules education meeting, that opinion was based on a lot of research and a lot of effort. There were, there's no gray area here. It's very black and white. The executive order is extremely legal. It was approved by both parts of the legislative body and supported by people. I've heard a lot of, I mean, one person who spoke probably gave us the most ammunition of anything to reject it. She said that there's been not a single child in Connecticut who has died from COVID. Maybe it's because we've had this mask mandate. I mean, Florida has made masks optional. What has happened there? They have the highest amount of deaths in children of any state in the country. I mean, to me, it's just ludicrous to think out anything other than supporting the town attorney and supporting the moderator. And just for the record, I did a little bit of homework every single city in the state of Connecticut adheres to the, to the executive order. There isn't one single one who's disputing it. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Mattery. Carl Homan <clears throat> to be followed by William Lewis. All right, why don't you open that one up? So the Holman, we have a Jackie Holman, whoever's on that line has the floor. Okay. Um, for the past um, almost two years, I haven't worn a mask at all. And for these past two years, I haven't gotten sick at all. There's been no problems, yet the people around me that have worn masks have gotten sick and sometimes had to stay home for weeks and even months in some cases. I really think that we should just um, get back to normal. You know, because the masks really aren't doing anything. Well, and the issue before us is the, whether the town attorney's opinion that this out of order should go to our legislative and rules committee. That's what we are debating now. Thank you. He didn't know that because he missed that part of the call. It's getting kind of late for him. All right. Uh, William Lewis to be followed by Michael Spilo. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are two main reasons for appealing the refusal uh, by the chair to accept item eight. 
First, the assertion that we would be exceeding our lawful authority rests on the assumption that, that we would be contradicting authoritative and valid state level directives. Following the joint committee meeting last week, I think most people left believing the governor had ordered that all students be masked and that the legislature had passed some sort of law codifying this. Uh, since then, we learned that in fact, the governor did not mandate universal school masking. He simply directed state agencies to develop mask guidelines seemingly only relating to the unvaccinated. A state agency then went farther and mandated masking for all in all schools. At some point along the way, the state legislature did pass a resolution simply endorsing the governor's uh, emergency powers. The point being the so-called mandate for schools is really more of a state agency guideline and not something directly issued by top state officials. The other point to bear in mind is that the state's authority to issue masks order mass for healthy people is very much in question, regardless of which state level authority might be attempting to do it. State universal mandates are being overturned across the country and Connecticut's might well uh, fall next, in part thanks to a lawsuit filed by one of Greenwich's finest attorneys, Lindy Urso, which lawsuit is now working its way through the court system. So the main point is the only basis for believing that we're exceeding our authority is that we would be contradicting a state action that is itself likely a result of the state exceeding its lawful authority. And I don't think we should flinch. Michael Spilo to be followed by Seth Bacon. Do we have Mr. Spilo? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I'd like to point out that on previous matters of health, we've always taken up the issues, despite a variety of legal opinions, that the subject matter we were dealing with uh, was mandated by the state. In the past, we knew that we lacked the necessary expertise, and yet we took up this issue. I would urge that this is no different, um, irrespective of whether the state mandate is valid or not. Um, this was the case with our oil and gas ordinance, where the state uh, Office of Legislative Re Research told us that the wastes were banned in the state. And whether such ordinances are more or less permissive hardly matters. Either we are overriding state legislation, which do doing things our way and potentially leaving the courts to sort things out, um, or we're not. And we have repeatedly chosen to take the path of going our own way on bags, on environmental issues, and on matters of health. Um, when these objections were raised in the past, uh, the ordinance were passed and caused specific problems and had to be overridden again by the state legislature. In particular, Stanford uh, paving came to a halt and the state legislature then took action. If, our ordin if we decide to pass the ordinance and it um, turns out to be uh, problematic, the state can do the same. Thank you. All right, Seth Bacon to be followed by Brooks Harris. We are approaching our 30 minute limit. So these may be our last speakers, we'll see. Seth Bacon. Can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes. Thank you. The proponents of this item continue to cite misleading scientific and legal information to confuse and conflate the issues and facts on this ordinance. For example, other towns have not dismissed the mask mandate and the claim that no children have died in the state of Connecticut is patently false. These are just two examples of the dangerous misrepresentation of information that's being presented to us all. There's a coordinated effort you're hearing tonight to try and make the subjective objective and there is no subjectivity to legal order. The town attorney, attorney has reviewed this already Legislative and rules have reviewed this already. As Ms. Ahmad and others have said, there are other avenues that the promoters, proponents can explore if they feel so strongly on this point. There's no scientific basis for their arguments. There's no legal basis for their arguments. I'd like to speak further on this if we go to the merits, but I'd urge you not to vote in favor of anything that would help circumnavigate the longstanding rules of the RTM. Brooks Harris, I believe, will be our last speaker on the appeal. All right. Um, Brian Rainey. Okay. Uh, Jessica Maloney with us. No. Um, Linda Whitridge. Linda Whitridge.
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving us the time and I'm glad that I got to just speak. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of my kids. Um, and I just, I wanted to just say that as petitioners, as someone else mentioned, we aren't saying that we know better, but we are parents who do know best for our children. And I, I strongly believe a parent's choice to make decisions for their children is the natural state of humanity. Um, there are other towns making this move to at least open discussion. So I just, I agree with Mr. Higby that it would be fair to open the topic to further discussion with the people that represent this town's children. Thank you so much. All right, we have now reached the 30 minute limit that we adopted on debate of this appeal. I will now call for the vote. Let me state the question. Mr. Higby has appealed under our rules, uh, particularly the provision that says any member may appeal from an opinion of the town attorney and we will then decide by majority vote whether to refer this to the legislative and rules committee for further study and conference with the town attorney and a report at the next regular meeting. So if you are in favor of um, sending the question of the town attorney's opinion to our legislative and rules committee for a report in January to be followed by a vote on whether item eight is in legal order or not, that would be decided by the members. If there's a majority vote currently to keep this, uh, to send this to legislative and rules. So if you wanna do that, if you wanna send this to legislative and rules, you should vote yes. If you uh, do not want to do that, you vote no. Okay, any questions? I ask our district tabulators to please mark your voting cards Higby appeal of town attorney opinion on item eight. Yes, if you wanna send this legislative and rules, no, if you do not and therefore uphold the town attorney's opinion. We will, uh, we will need to await the result of this vote. So I ask our district tabulators to please try and expedite the voting. I'm sorry, put up the five minutes because we need to conduct the voting within five minutes. So we will continue, you know, we'll, we'll take the votes we have at that time. All right, we have the result of the vote on the uh, Higby appeal of the town attorney's opinion <clears throat> on the legal order of item eight. Those in favor of referring this to our legislative and rules committee of uh, 43, Opposed 141, abstaining seven. That appeal has failed. Any further uh, issues to be brought before the meeting on this? Mr. Spilo, did you say you wanted to do something? Mr. Spilo? Yes, uh, I've uh, been unmuted. Um, well, I'm, uh, I don't see that a vote to overrule the ruling of the chair will carry any more votes than uh, the vote to appeal. Um, if the vote to appeal had passed, perhaps there'd be an alternative. Um, so I, I uh, decline to make any further motions. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have now discussed. Uh, Tom? Yes. Uh, it's Kip Bergweger. Did you, yes. did we get the vote on uh, the merits on item seven? Did I give you that vote? No. Oh, sorry. All right, I have the result of the vote on item seven. This was the sense of meeting resolution that candidates declare um, candidacy for moderator and moderator pro tem in time for inclusion in the January call. Those in favor, 171. 
Opposed, 19, abstaining three. Item seven has carried. There being no further business to come before the meeting, that is, uh, that is all we need to do tonight. I thank all those who showed up in person. I thank all those who made this meeting happen and uh, calculating the votes. I wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Now, I will see you in January. Moderator continues until successor is selected. So I will be back in January to start the meeting. I wish everyone a happy new year. I thank everyone for the kind words tonight. Uh, it has just been a, every minute has been a pleasure. Believe me. <laughs> thank you. I, I, I thank our moderator pro tem Alexis Volgaris for making all that happen tonight. Thank you very much. From the happy new year. Oh, yes. Apparently we have some refreshments. Everyone is invited if you'd like some some cake.